Thanks for being here to learn about herbs and the wonderful ways that they help to heal your body. My business, Hands on Health, I like to think that I am your apple, your apple of a day that will keep the doctor away. I'm here to help you and support you in any way I can to heal your body from a holistic perspective. So what is a whole food? Why are we talking about food, Paula? I thought this was about herbs. Because herbs are foods. Herbs are the foods that help to nourish your body's cells back to health and healing. A whole food is a substance that you take into your body that's in its whole state. Nothing has been added to it, such as preservatives, um, additives, artificial colors, artificial flavors, and nothing has been taken away from it. Nothing has been refined and moved out of it. And the difference um, would be between a whole grain flour, like let's say whole wheat flour of any kind, or a refined white flour that is the wheat that's had the germ and the bran removed. So that is food that's had something removed from it. Um, they are, anytime a food is not in its whole state, that food is not at the level of wholeness to keep your body cells whole. The nutrients and the life force energy of your body cells if a food is not whole, it will tend to degenerate your body cells and move your body towards degenerative disease. So it's very important to always put whole foods in your body. There's the human body cell, and th this is what replicates every day to create new body cells for you. And the replication of your body cells is based upon the food that you put in your body. So if you are putting whole foods in your body, your cells are gonna replicate at the same level of health that they are right now or healthier. If you're putting refined processed packaged foods that are full of all kinds of add additives into your body, your body cells are gonna replicate at a level weaker less healthy than the parent cell. And over years of your life, those weaker cells get weaker and weaker, and that is what creates degenerative um, diseases in your body. So it is very important to feed your body with whole foods. And if we think about it, human beings never had anything but whole foods to eat until the fabulous advent of manufactured food and we can put as much crap in at as the lowest cost for the manufacturing company and sell it to you under the guise of food. Don't be fooled. Most packaged products are not fit to eat. So that's just a really quick overview of Whole Foods. Oh, unfortunately, I think this slide is gonna get cut off for you. Um, what it says across the top is Body Systems Herb Garden, and it's a circular garden design that I created years ago, and someday I'll actually build this garden in my yard. Um, but each piece of the pie was meant to have different herbs in it that support different systems in your body. And you'll see if you read it over, there's a lot of um, cross-referencing the same herbs in different pieces of the pie because that's the beauty of herbs and food. It supports our whole body and our whole body's cellular health. Herbs are food. Learn to use the herbs in ways that enhance your cellular health, your general body health. And if we think about food, um, herbs being food, there's nothing magical or mystical about them. Um, it's not any different if you're putting, say, hawthorn berry in your body than if you are putting carrots into your body or an apple. It's just another plant food, and it happens to have a um, affinity for, hawthorn berry has affinity for your the cardiac system, and it's very healing to the heart. So it's just a plant food that helps your heart to heal. Um, always feel very safe about using herbs. 
If you need help, by all means, ask somebody who's knowledgeable in the use of herbs, because there are some herbs that you could get in trouble with, and I use that word very gently because I don't want to um, scare anyone away from using herbs. But there are some herbs that it's best that you um, know what you're doing with them. And one of them would be like foxglove. Foxglove, if not used correctly, could be toxic. Um, Pennyroyal is another herb that if not used correctly could be toxic. But for the most part, very few herbs have those kind of effects. And actually what that toxic effect is, it's just an overdose. It's the medicinal effect and you're getting too much of that medicinal effect. And so therefore it's, an, it's a toxic effect. And even the beta carotene in a carrot, if you eat too many carrots, every day for weeks on end um, those carotenoids in the carrot in the carrots that you're eating um, could begin to build up to toxic levels so it's all relative what is an herb an herb is a plant it you may be using the leaf you may be using the flower the seed um, the root the bark, the berry, and it may be the sap. You can see in that one picture, it's um, pine pitch. And pine pitch is used for a lot of skin disorders like psoriasis. So you're using parts and pieces of the plant in different types of medicine to create a healing effect in your body. What exactly do I do with them? Um, Again, I'm sorry if that top part is being cut off in the slide. Healing teas and infusions. Um, a tea, generally speaking, most people think of as something that they, you know, put a tea bag, whether it's for um, green tea or black tea, or there's herbs in the tea bag. Put that bag into your um, cup of hot water and then let it steep for a few minutes and then pull the tea bag out and you've got a healing tea. Well, to create a healing tea, you really need to make an infusion, a long steeped infusion. And when I say long steeped, I mean hours. And to do that, what you do is bring your water to a boil and you add the herbal plant parts and pieces once the water has come to a boil and then you stir it in, put the cover on, and you leave it somewhere for a minimum of four hours. I usually tuck it into my oven and just leave it overnight and let it steep in that hot water, which obviously is going to cool down slowly but surely. But let those herb parts and pieces steep in the water over the entire night. Depending on what you're using for um, herb, the herbs, if it's a seed, a root or bark of a plant that those plant parts are harder and they need to um, be gently simmered for 10 15 20 minutes and very very gently simmered you don't want to roll and boil them so you would put those harder plant parts into the water that you've brought to a boil stir it put the cover on and then on the extremely lowest heat you possibly can and if you need to lift the pot up off the heat source to get it away from it so that it's just gently simmering um, simmer it for 10 15 20 minutes then shut the pot off if you need to add leaf flowers or berry parts of herbs um, you would add it at that point in time when you've got the heat shut off stir that in and then tuck your pot away and let it um, steep so that you have a really strong medicinal infusion type tea um, four to 12 hours later. I usually, when I'm making teas, the jar that you see in this picture is a half gallon jar and I'll make somewhere between a half gallon and a gallon of tea so that I've got enough for two to four days at a time. This particular tea, um, I'm looking at it, I can see there's definitely rosemary in it the tea has kind of a red tinge to it and rosemary dried rosemary will do that to uh to an herbal tea it gives it that really pretty red tinge tinctures are something that you make 
with a base such as alcohol, vinegar, or as you see in the center there, the vegetable glycerin. So you take, you see the jar in my hand, um, that jar, I believe if I remember correctly, that was motherwort plant that I had blended up in uh, my blender. Um, no, actually that looks like a vinegar. That looks like a vinegar tincture. So God knows what I was making in that one. But what you do is you take your, vet, um, your plant parts and pieces, the herbs that you're gonna make a tincture out of, and you pack them into a jar. Then you fill the jar to up over the level of the plant matter with alcohol, if you wanna make an alcohol-based tincture, if you want to make a vinegar based tincture, which is nice to use um, those herb vinegars to make salad dressings, or if you want to make a non-alcohol um, tincture, you can use vegetable glycerin. And vegetable glycerin is nice if you're making tinctures for children and you don't want them to have the alcohol based um, tinctures. So then you fill it up to over to the top of the level of the plant. So the plants are always submerged underneath the liquid menstruum and you close it. That particular cover on that jar that I'm holding in my hand is a plastic cover. Not a good one. Um, I'm sure I replaced that with the two-part metal cap that you use in canning because that has a rubber seal on the inside. You want to leave your tincture sitting for at least four weeks in a dark place some place that where you'll remember, I usually sit them inside the cupboard and then I take them out once a day and give them a good shaking to mix the plant parts and pieces up with the vodka, vinegar, or glycerin and then just tuck it back in the cupboard. Sometimes I have left tinctures sitting for several months before I've actually strained them. And then you just, when the time is up, you strain them and squeeze all the liquid out of the wet plant parts and save that liquid and that is your tincture and then based upon your your age your body weight you use a certain number of drops of it um, two to four times a day and obviously an, an adult is going to use more of a tincture on a daily basis than a child is liniments poultices ointments and salves are basically you're just again infusing the plant chemical constituents, the healing constituents of the plant into an oil or in the case of a, a liniment, it's into rubbing alcohol. I've never made my liniments with rubbing alcohol. I tend to make them with vodka. That way if somebody makes a mistake and takes it, even you should label your bottles that this is not for oral consumption, but in case somebody made a mistake, if your liniment is made with vodka, just like you would a tincture, it's not going to hurt anyone if they drank um, any, you know, any amount of it. They might get a little intoxicated, but at least they're not drinking rub and alcohol and it's not going to kill them. So a liniment is something that I make again with vodka. A poultice is something where that gentleman's leg, you take the plant and you break it up into very small pieces and you moisten it. A very simple one that you can do is with um, plantain, and I'll show you a picture of a plantain soon, but you just take plantain and chew it up in your mouth and get it really broken up really well, and then put it over bug bites or stinging nettle, um, irritated skin, and it's just an easy poultice that you can make right outside as a simple first aid. Um, other poultices, you can mix the herbs into an oil like um, almond oil or olive oil and then you put that plant material onto the skin that you where you want the healing effect to happen, cover it up with cotton. You can also wrap the cotton in plastic if you wanted to then apply dry or moist heat to it. Ointments and salves are basically the same thing you put your herbal plant into olive oil and you leave it for um, a matter of two to four weeks again and then when you strain and squeeze the plant matter to get all the oil out you add you warm it up and you add beeswax to it 
to bring it to a harder consistency so you don't have a liquid oil. You can keep it in the herb oil form and just use that liquid oil or add the beeswax to it and make it into an ointment or add a little more beeswax into it. Excuse me. Um, ointment is a little less solid and then the salve is a little more solid than an ointment so you're just adding a little bit more beeswax to it to get the salve consistency um, another way that you can make uh, ointments and salves is put your plant matter in the oil and turn your oven on to say like 170 to 180 degrees max make sure the herb parts and pieces are covered with the oil in a nice stainless steel pot and then put a cover on the pot set it in the oven and leave it for several hours on that really low heat that will help pull the medicinal constituents out of the herbs faster than just leaving the jar sitting um, on the shelf for weeks and then you can make your medicinal uh, ointment or salve more quickly and you can have it available to use Lotions and balms are basically the same things as ointments and salves. You just add a few different ingredients in them to make them more of a lotion consistency. And a balm is a lot like um, an ointment. It's a little less solid than an ointment. So there's um, not a whole lot of difference between them. A lotion, you're making it into more of a creamy based healing medicine so that you can rub it into your skin, maybe into cracked, chapped hands and feet, um, cracked, chapped face, and then you're applying those healing herbs to the skin that needs to, the skin that needs to be healed. You also see pictures here of um, essential oils, and essential oils are a great way to create um, lotions, balms, you can make them very quickly instead of infusing the plant materials into the oils just simply take your oils and add take your like the olive oil and add drops of the essential oil that you want for whatever the healing purpose is and I'll give you an example here lavender lavender on the end is a very soothing um, a very soothing essential oil for the skin and it's very calming so let's say somebody wanted to make a salve or a lotion to promote relaxation and perhaps sleep so what you would do is take a couple tablespoons of organic olive oil and <clears throat> then for each tablespoon of the olive oil add a good four to six drops of the lavender oil and then you can use that just as an essential oil infused olive oil or you could add the beeswax to it and turn it into a balm salve ointment type of thing and then use it at night as a massage a foot massage if you massage um, the feet with these essential oil infused lotions bombs etc it's puts those essential oils into your system very quickly and then they do their medicinal work so if you put a lavender lotion on somebody's feet at nighttime it would help that person to relax and fall asleep eucalyptus is a great essential oil for opening the airways and making easier breathing tea tree is a fabulous antimicrobial anti-fungal um, peppermint's great for the digestive tract rosemary is a really good skin stimulant it's um a nice essential oil to put into a hair or facial medicinal product to stimulate the skin to bring circulation to the skin because if you bring circulation to the skin you are bringing oxygen and nutrients and it helps to heal the skin faster um, rosemary is also good for keeping your skin nice and youthful looking there's a few other um, essential oils i would throw in with rosemary to make a, um, a skin lotion that would be for, say, sun damaged skin or aging skin. And then at the bottom, we have what's called um, an elderberry syrup. 
And they're often a honey infused. So you're infusing the herbs into honey and that is creating a syrup to get the herbal medicine that you want to into, um, into children in particular. Elderberry syrup is good for the immune system. It's for boosting the immune system during cold and flu season. Nourishing nettles. Nettles are one of my very favorite um, herbs, plants, wild plants. They are a nutritive herb, meaning that they add nutrition to your body cells. So they're a really wonderful herb for improving the um, health of your individual body cells because they add a lot of minerals and nutrients to your diet. Um, and you can use herbs, um, you can use this, the stinging nettles as a tincture, you can make teas out of them. Again, the long steeped infusion teas. Um, you can cook them and use them. Stinging nettles, if you look at the plant on the right, you will you have to look really closely, but the stalk and the leaves have little prickly, um, just little prickly needles on them. And, those, and you can see it on the edge of the plant to the right as well. If you look at, um, the leaf on the far left of the picture you can see their little hair like needly things and when you touch stinging nettles it'll leave a tingling in your skin for hours for example last night for dinner i went out and i picked plucked pulled whatever you want to call it um a lot of the stinging nettles that sort of become renegade nettles in my herb flower my herb beds so I was pulling them to get them out of my herb beds but also knowing I was going to take them inside that it was good food so I don't mind that they grow there I just keep them plucked out all summer long and it gives me food to add to soups and stir fries and salads and stuff so anyhow I went out and I'm plucking them out of my herb beds with my bare hands knowing full well that this was probably five o'clock last night when I got up at six o'clock this morning, my hands still had that tingly feeling that you get from handling stinging nettles. And probably by 10 o'clock in the morning, noon at the latest, that tingly feeling was gone. They used to take whole stalks of nettles and flail people's um, joints that had rheumatoid arthritis and also flail the spinal column of people who had things like muscular dystrophy and multiple sclerosis. So flail the muscles that were involved, flail the joints that were involved and along the spinal column. So that stinging effect that lasts for hours is just, it's putting medicinal properties into your body. That's why I don't wear gloves. I figure it's good for me. Nettle tea is an awesome, awesome tea for building vitality. It's a real um, feeder for your adrenal glands. Uh, most people get up in the morning and have coffee and coffee gives your adrenal glands a surge in the morning so that you get that energetic feeling. But in the long run, coffee wears your adrenal glands down. It wears them out. Whereas nettle tea doesn't give you that big bold surge that coffee does in the morning it's more of a gentle all day long surge and all lifelong surge because if you drink nettle tea on a daily basis what you're actually doing is nourishing and building the cellular health of your adrenal glands and so it helps you to build a lifelong energy as opposed to being dependent on coffee to get that little buzz in the morning Spring leeks. Um, I love leeks, another great herb. In the spring, where we live here in this Northeast, we have spent the winter generally eating heavier foods and our bodies get heavier and sluggish um, just from the long winter. And in order to get our chi energy flowing in our body, our blood circulation flowing in our body, the lymphatic circulation, and to get the liver and the gallbladder flowing, your colon flowing, spring herbs are fabulous for that. Dandelion leaves, um, the spring leeks, the nettles, they really give your body a kickstart in the spring to clean out the liver, clean out the colon, and get all those fluids in your body and your chi life force energy moving. So it's, it's much fun to 
to go and dig leeks in the spring and use them in soups and stews and salads. I love them with eggs. Um, I'll take a couple of eggs and, and I like my eggs really soft, sunny side up. And so I'll put the eggs in my little cast iron frying pan and then chop the um, leeks up and put them on top of the raw eggs and then just put a little bit of shredded cheese on top put a cover on the little cast iron pan and just let it cook for two three minutes on low and it cooks the eggs it melts the cheese and then you have these beautiful leeks that are just caught between the cheese and the egg but you're not really cooking them and losing their vital enzymes and stuff of the raw food that they are and it's just a yummy breakfast brunch um love leeks the other thing i love to do with leeks in the spring is to save the last bit of my winter stored cabbage and root vegetables and then when the leeks come out i grate those root vegetables and cabbage up and make sauerkraut and put a whole bunch of chopped leeks into that sauerkraut let it sit in my kraut crock for at least two weeks and then for the whole summer I will have six to eight quarts of this leek infused sauerkraut that's absolutely delicious. You open up one of the quart jars and you immediately smell the leeks, which is a little intoxicating for some people, but it's a marvelous food to have. The one thing I always tell people when you're wild crafting herbs of any kind, be kind to the plants. Take just a few from each little patch, leave some for other people and leave some for regrowth and I usually like in a patch of leeks and you can see that picture on the bottom left hand corner it's just really a field of leeks that goes on forever and ever um, but there's like little maybe four or five foot diameter two to five foot diameter patches of leeks all through the woods and in each one of those little patches I would only dig two or three leeks and then move on and I try to remember where I've dug in that particular um, woods so that I'm not digging in the same patch more than once or twice during a spring season so that they have plenty of leeks left to regenerate for year after year after year and and that and that's the case with any um, any plant that you're harvesting always leave some for others and always leave some for regeneration for next year burdock and dandelion root they are fabulous liver cleansing herbs they stimulate the liver to sh express bile into the gallbladder into the small intestine it helps to cleanse out the liver and gets things moving in the intestinal tract to help clean out the intestinal tract they are fabulous healing plants um, dandelion greens do the same thing the greens of a plant we harvest in the spring and summer and then in the fall when the top plant the green part of the top plant dies back the energy of the plant goes back into the roots and so in the fall in winter that's when we harvest the roots and use them red raspberry leaf is a wonderful plant for healing the reproductive tract it is often considered a female reproductive tract healing plant but as with any plant if it heals the female reproductive tract, it is also healing to the male's reproductive tract. It's a uterine tonic, so it helps to tone the uterine muscle. It's an excellent plant to use to increase fertility, to increase the tone of the uterus and the reproductive tract. And also, it's an excellent herb to drink during pregnancy to keep your uterus really healthy and fit, ready for um, the work of labor and delivery. It's also a high mineral plant. It's a great herb to add with nettles to make a bone tea to strengthen the um, strengthen your bones. Other herbs that I'll talk about as we move along here that are also good for the bones, I'll mention as we go. What I try to do is I make, um, like I said, I make somewhere between a half gallon and a gallon of herb tea at a time. And I usually always use nettles and then one time I make it, I'll add comfrey leaf to it. The next time I'll add mullein leaf to it. The next time I'll add red raspberry leaf. The next time I'll add alfalfa or oat straw. So 
every five or six times that I make it, I'm adding a different herb with the nettle and then I just rotate back through them again. And then you get all those wonderful healing properties of the different herbs over a course of say a month. Fertility tea is again, we're going back to those uterine herbs, the red raspberry, the nettles for nutrition, and then red clover. That is a great um, tea to make to increase your fertility if you want to get pregnant as a woman. And then once you have achieved a pregnancy, again, um, whole foods come into play here. We can't use herbs and think that they're going to solve all our problems if we're eating a lousy diet. Our body needs to be fed with whole foods. Once we've achieved the pregnancy, we can go on to use the red raspberry for the uterine tonic with the nettles throughout the rest of the pregnancy to build nutrition, build mineral stores, to build uterine tone and health for a healthy labor and delivery. Birth control, these are wonderful plants to use as birth control and I'm just gonna touch on them very um, quickly here because the actual topic of using um, plant-based birth control is one that could be a class all in of, of itself, a very long class. Up on top you'll see the wild GM plant what they think that the wild GM does is it makes the egg impenetrable by the sperm, so therefore it prevents the egg from being fertilized. Wild carrot um, is Queen Anne's lace. That is an herb that they believe how it functions is by making the uterine lining inhospitable to a fertilized egg, so therefore the egg can't implant. Pennyroyal is an herb that promotes um, evacuation of the uterus. So women could use the penny, pennyroyal towards the end of their monthly menstrual cycle and promote the actual start of bleeding. Rutin is a bioflavonoid of citrus fruits. It's a vitamin C bioflavonoid. Rutin is also believed to make the uterine lining inhospitable to a fertilized egg, so it just makes it impossible for that egg to implant. And then Jack in the Pulpit and Smartweed are both other um, herbs that are, they promote sterility. Um, not permanent sterility, but they promote sterility for a period of time and therefore they were used by American Indians and therefore they were very wise about what they were doing with them and knew how long that they could count on um, count on creating an infertility or a temporary sterile sterilization. So there are lots of plants that can, can be used to both promote fertility and to promote infertility. Male birth control, that's chicory and chicory is the root is used and it's made into a roasted root tea and it decreases sperm count in men. And so when I recommend to people that, that want to use plant-based birth control to come at it from a lot of different angles, from working with the female's body, with the male's body, working with the female cycle around when ovulation happens and and being wise and paying attention to that. Garlic and echinacea are amazing immune system boosters um, and they also are antimicrobial so they help to actually kill off, I hate to use the word kill, it sounds so harsh and violent, but they actually help to get rid of um, microbes in the system that could, that could cause infections. And they also boost the immune system so that your immune system is working harder. Your um, white blood cells and the lymphocytes and are working harder to gobble up microbes and any foreign invaders of the body. Mints are amazing for the digestive tract. Um, they're also, if this is gonna sound really kind of strange, 
but they're a calming stimulant. Um, unlike caffeine, which is just something that's a, a stimulant to the body, mints are a stimulant that is very calming. So it's a relaxing stimulant. It makes your body feel good. It brings circulation to your tissues, but it doesn't give you that buzz like caffeine does. And they're also very healing to the digestive tract. Um, a naturopathic physician that I have learned under was working with a woman who had digestive tract cancer and she was a bit older and making changes in her life wasn't going to be easy but he asked her what plant she had a lot of in her yard and she said she had a lot of mint and that's perfect for the digestive tract and he told her to make teas and eat as much of that mint every day as she could and within a few months her digestive tract cancer was completely healed so mint is an amazing healer to the body it's an amazing healer for the digestive tract hawthorn berry heart cardiac problems if you have a rapid heartbeat or you have too slow of a heartbeat what hawthorn berry will do is regulate your heartbeat in the direction that it needs to go. So if your heart needs to beat faster, it will tone and strengthen your heart so that that can happen. If you have a rapid heartbeat, it nourishes and tones and strengthens your heart so that your heart will naturally slow down so you don't have that tachycardia anymore. Um, it's an herb that I would recommend across the board for any cardiac issue. And then depending on what the cardiac issue is, adding in other herbs that would assist the hawthorn berry if there was high blood pressure or there was um, hardening of the arteries or clogging of the arteries there would be different herbs that you would use to help with that such as um, garlic would be a great one um, plants that are high in magnesium to relax the hardened arterial walls um, just different plants that would accentuate what the hawthorn berry does and they would work together synergistically to heal the cardiac health problem. Skin and bones too. The one on the left is the plantain that I was speaking about way back when I said that you could chew it up in your mouth and make a poultice and put it on insect bites or stinging nettle sting and it would help to soothe that as a, as a quick first aid out in the field. The plant on the right hand side is comfrey and the flowers are comfrey flowers. Comfrey is a plant that is also called knit bone, bone knit, bone set, um, very healing to the bones. And it's a great herb to use the leaves and add to like a nettle tea. And it puts a lot of minerals in your system to help um, strengthen bones so it's great for the bones I drank comfrey tea throughout both my pregnancies to keep my bones strong because being pregnant draws a lot on my body to create that baby that's growing in my uterus so the comfrey nettle tea and there was raspberry in it too for my uterus is to help keep your bones strong during pregnancy but also to build strong bones in your baby um, one of the things that I, over this past winter, I broke a couple ribs um, and I used a comfrey oil. I was rubbing it onto my ribs several times a day. I took a comfrey tincture for a few weeks and I drank comfrey tea. And all the horror stories I heard from people about how long it takes to heal ribs, it's been just a hair over two months now. And I'm not going to say they aren't still tight and I can feel it pull and I can definitely feel where they were broken. But I think I, I know I healed a lot faster than most people do because I was using that stuff very consistently every day to help heal my bones. Um, plantain, you can make into an ointment and that ointment is wonderful for healing the skin, all kinds of things like eczema and psoriasis, and even just a, um, a skin lotion for the face. It's very healing and very nourishing to skin tissues. 
St. John wort, um, it's been used, if you know anything about herbs at all, it's been used for depression. It's a wonderful herb for depression. Um, it's also used for a lot of other things, treating and calming anxiety and insomnia. It's great for the skin. It's great for inflammation. It's just all around a really nice herb um, to use for a variety of purposes. This is mullen, another plant that I love. You can see in that center picture, mullen is the plant that, if you look to the left, the bottom left-hand corner of that picture, the first year mullen grows, it just grows in that floweret on the ground and it doesn't get any higher up off the ground than that. Then the second year, you get that stalk like that's in the center that grows anywhere from three feet tall um, to five, six feet tall. The yellow flowers can be soaked in oil and make a oil-based um, herbal healing remedy for earache and ear, ear infection. It's also, mullen is very good for the glands and it, it's very healing to all the glands in your body. It's kind of like a master herb for all the glands. And so you can use that oil, like say to rub it on your thyroid, um, I know people who have used it in the case of undescended testicles in infants, rubbing that mullen oil on the testicles. Um, and you can also take it internally as a tea, as a tincture to help with all those things. If you had a thyroid problem, if you had adrenal fatigue, adrenal burnout, and you just needed something to um, revitalize your glandular system, even the ovaries, all of your glands work together in symphony. And so if one of your glands is struggling, all of them are. It, that's just the one that's showing symptoms now. And mullen is just a nice herb to use to kind of build the health and strength of your glandular system. It's also really good for asthma. Um, people will take the leaves that you see there in the right hand corner they're very soft it's like this woolly soft velvety leaf they'll dry those leaves and then they take the plant material and they roll it and smoke it which sounds kind of crazy when you think about it when you have asthma to be smoking something but it help it helps to open the airways i think i would recommend to people another herb called lobelia that beautiful blue plant that a lot of people buy in hanging baskets. Um, a lobelia tincture, if you take it when you have those breathing difficulties from asthma, it will open your airways instantly. Marvelous mint, I love this picture, it's in my backyard. Um, uh, a friend gave me that mint years ago and I'm trying to cultivate it and keep the deer away from it. They seem to love it as well. Rhubarb, a beautiful plant most of us recognize as something that we put in pies or we sweeten and make a sauce out of and pour over ice cream. Um, and then there's a drink that people make in the summertime. I forget what it's called, but it's using that rhubarb sauce and maybe vodka, I don't know. Anyhow, rhubarb, what you use is the stalks. If you eat the stalks, they have a very laxative property, which means that they relax the colon, they soften the stool, and they move things out of your body. They help your body um, detox if you're constipated. The root is very good for that as well. A lot of herbal medicines um, use the root in um, a combination with other herbs for people with constipation problems. Never eat the leaves of the rhubarb plant, those are toxic. So you can eat the stalk and you can use the root, but leave the leaves alone. Put them on the ground, let them compost back into the ground. On the left-hand side, you see sheep sorrel. That's a fun plant in the spring. It's one of those first things that are popping up when we need that green food that gets our chi life force energy going and cleanses our liver out. And just the green food that we need in the spring for the chlorophyll, for the vitamin A, our bodies just need it. Cleavers is a really good um, herb for the urinary tract system. It's soothing and healing. It's soothing and healing for urinary tract issues. Marshmallow root is another very soothing plant. Um, and you'll see the flowers here. 
the root in its whole form and then up in the right hand left hand corner I'm sorry is the dried root very good for things like ulcers external skin ulcers internal digestive tract ulcers um, it's great to use to eat it to use it as a poultice on the skin it's very soothing and healing it kind of makes a very mucilosage mucilosage <laughs> mucilaginous i'm sorry my mouth was just not forming that word well it's just just very like egg whitey um consistency that is just very soothing inside and outside of the body there's the lobelia that's the beautiful plant people hang outside their homes lobelia is an amazing airway opener for people with asthma um taking a few dropperfuls, it's like an instant opening of the airway. And you saw this at the beginning of the slideshow. I just want to remind you that herbs are food and we need to think of them that way. We also need to think about when we remember that herbs are food, we also remember, have to remember that we need to feed our bodies well with whole foods as our, our dietary habit. Herbs cannot make up for a bad diet. Herbs work synergistically, cooperatively alongside your food. And so when your diet is in place as a whole food diet that's healing to your body cells, the herbs are there to support and assist your body in healing. And the last slide, just a little reminder, if you need some help figuring out what a whole food diet is, the very first book that I wrote, Hands on Health, goes into the details of putting a whole food diet into your life and many people said to me they get it it made so much sense but they couldn't get over the emotional and spiritual humps that kept them in their negative lifestyle habits so the second book that i wrote early morning coffee and donuts is what i call yoga for the mind it's little morning inspirations to open your heart open your mind and open your spirit to healing, to thinking differently, and to acting and functioning differently in the world, in your world, so that you make healthier healing choices around food and about around your lifestyle habits. Um, the second book isn't out yet. As of today is April 21st, 2015. Um, it should be coming out soon. Um, so those are just my little guideline books to assist you in the whole food process. And then herbs on top of your whole food diet is an amazing healing um, way for you to treat your body on a daily basis. So thank you for listening. If I can help you in any way, you know how to get a hold of me. Have a great day. Bye.